Thanks, Heather. That was quite a surprise to have um, some quite old publications read out by name. A nice reminder. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so thank you very much um, for what has already been a, a very warm welcome to Montreal by Heather and your, your team over lunch. And thank you also to the MSSI for this opportunity to share some of the very active learning that we're doing um, in the carrier program, which I'll introduce in a bit more detail later, um, as we are really trying to pursue um, impact and positive change um, in the communities, in, in the countries, and in the regions in which we're working in that program. Um, I'm excited to share our learning with you, and really I hope that this talk will do the one thing that any talk can do, the best thing it, it can do, which is spark a dialogue that will con continue far beyond this afternoon. Um, and since it was International Women in Science Day yesterday, I just wanted to take a moment just to, for the woman in the room just to say that um, I see you, I'm with you, and thanks for the inspiration. Actually, two people in front of me here are a big inspiration for me as well, so thanks very much. And I wanted to start off today by opening up what we understand by research impact. When we use this term, it often conjures up ideas around impact factors and H indices. But I agree with Professor Mark Reed in the UK who describes research impact much more broadly, even if some of our universities haven't caught up with this yet. He describes it as the good that our research can, can do in the world. And sometimes we can pursue this good by getting our work cited because it is true that citations influence discourse and discourse can change the world. But unfortunately, as sustainability scientists, I think we know that the rate at which the world is changing means that the ability of our citations alone to generate the kind of change that we need to generate um, is quite insufficient. So we need to do more and we need to do better. And so I think that as sustainability scientists, we're not only ethically obliged to pursue the good that our research can do in the world, but we're also morally obliged to really pursue that kind of impact. And I'd also like to open up, before I go any further, the nature of the sustainability challenge that I think we have before us. Because not only do we confront the need for new methodologies to pursue change, we confront this with the need to look at what can feel like, at least to, to me, an abyss of complexity. I say an abyss because as we understand more fully all the time the deeply connected problems, issues, solutions before us, and the deeply connected solutions and also the urgency with which we have to respond, I think that we can feel quite hopeless if we're not vigilant with ourselves. And so we confront sustainability challenges, some of us with the conviction that we have to do more, that we need to generate change, but also at a dejection after a while or for some of us that we can do anything in the face of this complexity. But we can make a difference precisely because these systems are connected across scales, which means that small changes in local places can move across systems in ways that we don't yet fully appreciate. And so I'm here to share with you just some stories of change that are, are, are happening in this program. I hope that they are small stories of hope and methodologies to maintain that hope um, and integrity in the sustainability sciences so that we're able to hold our heads up as we claim that we are sustainability scientists. Because there's no turning away from this abyss. For any of us who've seen it, who understand the complexity, there is no turning away for any of us. And so I think we have to find methodologies that help us deal with it. I never use notes. I, I did it today, and it's not a good idea at all. <laughs> OK, so I'd like to start off by giving you then one example of a complex sustainability challenge, which IDRC partners um, are, are working in a project called Hiaway, run out of Isimod in Kathmandu, Nepal. The Hindu Kush Him Himalayan region is the source of 10 large river systems in, in Asia. If you look at the names of these rivers, you'll recognize them. The Yellow River, the Yangtze, the Mekong, the Irrawaddy, the Ganges, the Indus, major river systems. And it provides water and other ecosystem services to 210 million people in the mountain regions and over one and 1.3 billion in the floodplains. That's way more than 10% of the global population. Yeah? De dependent on water coming out of one system. The Hindu Kush region is and, and its glacier and snow fed river systems are highly vulnerable to climate change impact and climate change induced shifts in the timing and pattern of rainfall, especially monsoon rainfall 
and of glacier and snow runoff in the region are already having an impact on water resources, including water availability and also energy because of hydroelectric power. The, the region has been described, though, as a black hole of, of information because only 1% of its 46,000 glaciers are actually monitored, so we don't actually know what is happening in this region in terms of glacier retreat. And a recent paper by our partners in, in the Highway Project and, and others showed quite clearly that a global temperature rise of 1.5 was too hot for this region. It would result in a, a two degree increase in temperature, which would result in 65% of these glaciers still being present by the end of the century. And so we have a case, I think, that is symptomatic of almost all sustainability challenges that we face. We have a system where the drivers of change are primarily external to the local context, climate change, the impacts are local and regional in a continuous system of people and nature. And we understand that the solution to these problem, to the problem of, of climate change is primarily a social and political issue, it's not a biophysical issue. So the solution lies in the social systems. But even though scientists have clearly shown that 1.5 degrees, which is our most optimistic projection for climate change, very unlikely that we will meet 1.5 degrees, and despite scientists claiming very, very strongly in one of the most respected international journals that 1.5 degrees is too hot. This is not led to any immediate policy change around climate change adaptation. And so here's the rub that I would like to, to get to today. How do we as sustainability scientists understand policy change happens? Do we see policymakers as thirsty for information that we can provide? Do we see an information deficit which once we fill it with the right questions, asked at the right time, in the right ways, and communicating that information accurately and in a timely way, that policies will respond and change. Is that how we see this happening? Much like the process of filling the potholes in this picture. This has been called the information deficit model of how policy change happens, and it's often implicit in how we see ourselves, how we design our projects, how we go about thinking about knowledge, generation, and impact. We feel an, an urgent information need and therefore we generate positive change in the world. This view is, however, deeply flawed and I think it makes all of us uh, complicit in our own failures to generate change. Policy development is in fact a very messy process, tied to its own histories, run through with vested interests, strongly influenced by power, and if you consider for a moment some of the historical struggles that have been waged to change things for the better, and how those struggles persist many decades later. From the US Civil Rights Movement to the Black Lives Matter Movement, from the Suffragettes Movement to the Me, the Me Too Campaign, from the end of apartheid to the Students Movement in South Africa, which has recently um, shaken higher education in that country to its core, Influencing policy and social change is not about generating the right information at the right time. When we start to see policy development in this much more dynamic, dynamic light, then everything we think we understand about stakeholder engagement, for example, necessarily needs to shift on its axis. Stakeholder engagement becomes about relationship building. It becomes about partnerships rather than feeding the right information to the right people. So now I'm going to share some ideas about what the shift might look like uh, from, in very practical terms from a project where we've been really trying to work a bit differently, failing as much as we succeed, but really actively trying to think about what we're doing. So CARIA, the Collaborative Adaptation Research Initiative in Africa and Asia, is a $70 million partnership between the Department of International Development and the IDRC. And the program is organized into four research consortia that work in three climate change hotspots across Africa and Asia. And I'm going to share some of the things that we've been learning about how to pursue impact. A climate change hotspot is a region of the world where high climate signal coincides with um, large concentrations of potentially vulnerable people with limited capacity to respond. So the three hotspots that we're focused on are semi-arid regions where we find 2.5 billion people um, 
in the agricultural se sector at, at least re reliant primarily on rain-fed agriculture. Um, on delta regions in Bangladesh, India, and Ghana, where you have large numbers of people living in delta regions, very, very susceptible to sea level rise. And the Hindu Kush Himalaya, which I've already described to you earlier. The goal of the program, and actually, Heather, you, you described our, our, our objectives, which I'm really glad about because I wasn't going to even touch on them. Um, because what I want to share with you actually is our impact state statement. This is from the whole program's theory of, of change. So what is the impact that this program wants to have in the world? And it's quite telling because it says that actors in planning, programming, policy, and research use a range of evidence-based tested options. So the program will generate the evidence and the tested options. But for us to consider our, ourselves successful, we have to have this information used. It's a fundamental part of the entire program. Knowledge gen generation alone would not qualify as success for this program. It is very much research-oriented, research-led. It's led by some very, very strong research institutions. The four consortia that were selected were selected because they were strong research institutions, but we married that with a really strong focus on research uptake. It's an ambitious program. We connect 450 researchers actively, not in a loose network, directly funded by the program and practitioners across 17 countries, two continents. Um, we have 40 implementing partners. And it brings together, and this is what I'll be touching on a little bit today, novel partnerships between these strong research institutions and strong advocacy partners. For example, in one consortium called ASA, that's Adaptation in, at Scale in Semi-Arid Regions, we see strong research institutions like the University of Cape Town, the University of East Anglia, um, and the Indian Institute for Human Settlements partnered at the PI level with two international N NGOs, that's Oxfam and Start International, as well as a number of smaller research practitioner partnerships lower down, which I've just um, put there in, in black text. But I want you to think about that for a moment. So at the PI level, a partnership between international NGOs and researchers. You would have seen Oxfam's recent report um, called Reward Work, Not Wealth, citing the fact that 82% of the wealth generated last year um, went to the richest 1% of the world's population. When this came out, it was cited in almost every news outlet anywhere in, in the world. And it came out almost on the day that that report was produced. So why was Oxfam able to do that? Was it because they had plugged a desperate information need? Had, did we know that we needed to know this? And the answer is no. They succeeded in doing that because they have a strong influencing campaign and communication strategy tied to everything that they do. And as researchers, we just quite simply don't have a clue about how to do this, how to get our research on the day that we release it, or even the next week, or even the next year, in every news headline around the world. So this is a skill that we've got something to learn, I think. And I think it's one of the greatest opportunities when, when we start partnering with these advocacy groups. It's one of the biggest um, opportunities I think we have in the sustainability sciences right now, and it's an underutilized opportunity, because we have a lot of common cause with a lot of advocacy groups. So now back to our original goal then of creating impact in the carrier program. We knew from the start that we would need to be very explicit about how we would achieve the impact that we were aiming for. And we therefore required each of the four consortia to, to develop their own theory of change. That is a description of the change they wanted to generate in, in the world and how they saw themselves getting there over a, a five year period. What is the pathway towards change that, that you see and we then created opportunities every year to reflect on the utility of that theory of change. How accurate is that theory of change? Do we need to change what we thought we needed to do? Are we going to achieve this impact? If not, do we still want this impact? Do we want to do something else? Or do we need to get back on, on, court, on course? Each of the consortia also had to produce their own what we call research into use strategy, which is research impact sort of writ large. And I'll explain that to you a little bit later. So we then created these annual and six monthly meetings for the research in, into use lead. So these are the, the leaders and there was usually a group of them per, per consortia who are really leading the way in terms of facilitating research in, into use in each of these consortia. 
And a strong community of practice has emerged around this issue of how do we generate impact from these really strong research con consortia. All of these teams were struggling with the same kinds of issues. Um, and so a, a group has really emerged, and these are just some of the pictures of meetings with this, with this group. And these opportunities for, for learning have been really critical in Carrier because what the Research into Use leads were doing and continue to do, the program is still on, on running, is really quite challenging. It's quite hard, and I want to explain why, and I think this may re re resonate with some of the projects that you're doing. The language of research into use, research impact, has been around since the 1990s. There's nothing very novel about claiming that the sustainability sciences should have impact. Everything, I mean, and even handbooks and case studies abound from everything from action research from the 1990s, participatory literature, but that tends to focus at community level, right? Organizations like the Overseas Development Institute, ODI, has developed really great policy influencing guides. And there's an emerging scholarship on social learning that tends to focus on individual and organizational learning. In Carrier, though, we had these aspirations that span multiple scales of impact and influencing. We had aspirations spanning policy and practice, and we had no idea about how to do this simultaneously. And we had cross-scale research, so the evidence base that, that our research in, into use leads are working from is multi-scale, it's transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, -dis all of that, and there's multiple contexts. So you're trying to draw lessons from India, from Mali, from Ethiopia, from Nepal, from Pakistan, and you want to say something together. It's really quite a challenging research into use task. So what have we learned then? What I'm about to share with you really represents the learning of a very big group, most, some of them in this, in, in this picture, from five years of very dedicated experimentation, failure, and success, sitting in, as I said, 17 countries. And what I'm going to do is to share just two stories with, with you, stories of, of change, where we saw positive change as a result of the efforts of our partners. And then I'm going to zoom out and share some of the bigger lessons we've learned about what it actually takes, what are all the different activities that are required to start pursuing research impact in these kind of complex contexts. So the first story I'm going to share from you, with you is um, a story from Ghana. And this footage was taken in, in Ghana in 2016 as part of the DECMA project which focuses on deltas as climate change hotspots. Prior to this footage, a great deal of research had already been done on the risks faced by communities living in the Volta River Delta. However, parliamentary at attention to the plight of these communities um, and the people exposed to this flooding had been very slow to materialize. So armed with this footage from a drone that was deployed by the research team, a well-known professor from the University of Ghana approached an MP, a Minister of Parliament, who was already eager to champion the cause of this community, but was battling to get parliamentary buy-in. And he took this problem into Parliament and garnered a great deal of support for, to support this particular community. And the reasons for success here included the use of a dramatic video I'm not sure if you can see it from your angle, it might be later on, but you can actually see in, in some parts of this video people running from, from the waves. So it was having a fairly dramatic video and having the right people connect with one another. And the experience highlighted, for example, that the need, to, the need to recognize that politicians or decision makers are a very diverse group. In this case, finding the right person, not necessarily with the right job description, just the right person, was key. And the footage served as a door opener for impact that then had to be backed up by data and information quite rapidly. So it's not that research is not vital here, but the footage came first and the research came second. And very often we think we need to have the right information at the right time and we can feed that information. And actually it was the footage that, that did that. Um, but then the team had to re react very quickly then with the rest of the data. The second story I'd like to share with you is from Botswana, from the ASAR project that I described earlier um, with that particular partnership, Adaptation at Scale in Semi-Arid Regions. 
So this case involved an, an alliance between the University of Cape Town, the University of Botswana, and one of the, the international NGO partners, Oxfam. The Assad team in Botswana had witnessed a dramatic, have witnessed a dramatic shift in attitudes among government officers with regard to the use of vulnerability and risk assessment methodologies to support communities to make substantial inputs into district development plans. And I'd like to explain to you how that happened. So vulnerability and risk assessment involves a participatory process of identifying different social groups within communities, identifying the risks that these different social groups face, and then identifying, um, considering the causes and consequences um, of these various risks in order to identify entry points for change. So what happened in Botswana then? While historically and, and culturally, Botswana has sought co community input into the design of district level development plans, the level of, of engagement at the village level tended to be top down and to favor the louder voices within the community. So at a vulnerability and risk assessment workshop in October 2015, an economic planner from local government was, was present. And now this workshop happened at a time when the sub-district was finalizing its inputs into the district development plan, which would then feed into the five-year national development plan within Botswana. And the economic planner became very excited about this process. He saw it as an opportunity to get community buy-in and input into the development plans. And the workshop resulted in the inclusion of a chapter on climate change in the district de development plan. So for us, that was already a bit of a success. We were quite happy with that. We would have been, yes, we've done something there, a chapter on climate change in the district development plan. That's great. What happened next, though, was that the Botswana government asked this team to offer training to all district development officers and all economic planners across the entire country. There's 16 districts so that they could start using this methodology to, to generate the district development plans. Now, what is interesting about this case is that we had an international NGO on board who was able and willing to respond to that request because this wasn't a request to generate any new knowledge. This was not, not something that universities were able to respond to very easily or, or, or to justify. But Oxfam, because this is what they do, uh, was able to respond to, to that need, and that training is about to begin right now. Um, Oxfam also tells us that it's because IDRC was part of the research in, into use thinking um, and that we, were, we allowed them to shift their budget lines around in response to that need. So there's certainly something there about donor flexibility. There's something there about having these different kinds of partners who are completely able to respond to capacity building needs. Um, and certainly also um, the presence of the University of Botswana and the University of Cape Town also added a bit of gravitas to Oxfam in that context, which was also part of that invitation. So it was really about the partnership in this particular context that I think resulted in that impact. Okay, so those are just two sort of short sort of vignettes, if you like, short stories of change being generated um, across the program. And now I want to step back and share the more holistic understanding that has emerged and been built by many, many of these stories that we've been sharing over a number of years now within the program. And also stories of failure have contributed to this, this development. So what is research into use? How do we, what, do we, what are the kind of activities that we are discovering are really fundamental to having this kind of impact? So stakeholder engagement is one of them. It's an important one, but it's not the only one. And it's in a particular form. So what, what we're learning is a stakeholder engagement that is sustained over time. So it's about long-term relationships, not flash interactions and then finished. Um, needs focused, really important. I'm gonna speak about that in a moment with regard to capacity building. It needs to be needs focused on what the stakeholders themselves are actually needing in a particular moment and strategic because we don't have time to engage with everyone all the time. So for example, in that um, Delta example, the right person, we knew that, 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 that they had a desire to, to do something strategically engage that person. Same with the economic planner in, in Botswana. When you've got an enthusiastic person, you know, put some energy in there for sure. Another interesting one though, I don't think uh, at least as an academic in my previous existence, I thought about this very much at all as being part of how I would pursue impact. Capacity building has emerged in the carrier program as probably the biggest opportunity that we've had to generate change. So, and this capacity building doesn't tend to be about the topic that we're researching. So the Botswana example, the capacity building request was not, the ASA team 
was using the vulnerability and risk analysis methodology because they were interested in socially, so socially differentiated experiences of vulnerability. That was the topic of their research. This was a methodology that they were using. Botswana government wanted training in the methodology for their district development plans. So it's not in the, on the, the topic that we were actually researching. Same in Nepal. I didn't give the story, but there, um, the highway program convened the National Adaptation Planning Network in, in Nepal and discovered in that workshop that the national planners didn't know what local planners were doing, local planners didn't know what national was doing, so they offered a certified course in adaptation planning, even though they wanted to talk about glacier retreat. But they offered that training so that the end users could actually engage with their research later on, and it contributed towards um, building relationships. The other thing about capacity building is it's not just users out there that need training, it's also researchers in here about how to work differently, how to be responsive, what is research into use, what are our responsibilities in, in relation um, to the systems in which we're working. Evidence. We tend to think that there's a research world happening outside of the impact-seeking activities involved in research into use. Actually, evidence is fundamental. It's one of the core activities involved in having an, having an impact. Um, and in particular forms, obviously, credible, relevant, con contextualized. We discovered in the carrier program, for example, we thought we'd be able to very easily transfer research lessons from, let's say, India to Kenya, from Kenya to Mali. That was one of the ideas in the program. But actually, we found that national governments are less interested in data from other countries. They are more interested in contextualized data from the countries in which they're working. Communication. Neither of the two stories that I, that I shared touched on this, but particularly now, in the later stages of the, of the program, as we start synthesizing data to higher scales, to regional and, and international levels, strong communications teams, strong branding is emerging as really, really important. And then these, these partnerships, and this really came out, I hope, in the Botswana story. So researchers, practitioners, we've been talking about this for a while. I think advocacy groups as well, um, doing things a bit differently. And then at the center of all of it needs to be a focus on monitoring and learning because RIU is an unfolding process. We, we see windows of opportunities that we have to respond to. We think we know what's happening and we fail and we, we need to be quite active in how we learn about how to do this. And then in the carrier program, at least and maybe in some of the work that you're doing, all of these things at multiple scales. Okay. So I'd like to just dwell for a, a moment, I'm nearly finished, um, on the novel partnership or novel alliance element of what I've just shared with you. It's certainly true that Oxfam's role in the ASAR consortium has brought new skills to, and capacities to that, that team in terms of understanding influencing campaigns, in terms of being responsive. However, Oxfam's involvement in the project also yielded positive outcomes for that organization itself. Oxfam joined the ASAR project quite cautiously in 2014, if you can imagine, for a development and humanitarian organization, um, the prospect of joining a long-term research project with very unclear impacts at any point in the future um, was not an easy sell within that organization. But in the fourth year of the, the partnership, they describe having gained extensive opportunities to, to expand their networks through this partnership, particularly in academic circles, which international NGOs are not always in, involved in. Internally, that team has recognized that partnerships with academics can grant a humanitarian organization an additional sense of credibility. It's got them into the IPCC negotiation processes, for example, um, and perceived robustness but that has to be always balanced with their primary objectives of generating impact on the ground. So in conclusion then, um, I would like to emphasize that I don't mean to give the impression that these kind of novel partnerships um, and these new approaches to pursuing research impact are easy. Um, quite the opposite, I think we struggle all the time with some of the often repeated thoughts, quite literally quotes um, captured here. Um, I think the one I hear the most at the moment is the, the research isn't finished yet, we can't communicate it. Wait. So we're all treading water waiting for the big impact of the project. Um, some research is unhappy with the strong focus on process instead of findings and how we do it. Um, there's nothing innovative about stakeholder engagement, it's just a lot of work. 
Um, what's been quite interesting, there's one about um, the NGO guy sticking to his role. Um, it's been very interesting how people have been put into their categories in this program. That's one part of the, what has been interesting. The other has been this enormous fluidity of roles, though. We have some researchers who now behave much more like advocates than the advocates themselves, and we have some advocates who, or some NGO partners who've really shifted into much more of a research mold. So we've seen this big fluidity of um, identity, and I think that actually indicates a fluidity of capacities, which is very positive for us. Um, one of the NGO guys, we're trying to change power structures in the world because that's why he agreed to get involved in a climate change project, but we haven't changed them here because this is still a research-led program, and NGO guys still don't have real power to change something in the program. Uh, but struggle is fine, though. I think struggle is even good. It's in the discomfort, I think, created for everyone in this program that we know we're shifting things even a little bit, um, and that we know that in subtle ways we're sort of changing these very well-trodden pathways that I think we all walk all the time. So thank you for your attention. I think that's it. Thank you. Well, that was really interesting. Thank you. And um, came from a, a very different angle to what I'd expected. And, and it was really, really interesting. So um, we have time now uh, for questions. But also, if you want, we can open up a, a discussion. I know some of you are researching in this kind of area. So feel free to ask questions, but also to, to discuss. Um, we have time. And then after this, we'll head out, and you can continue the conversation over a glass of wine. Actually. So one of the, the questions I have is how you built trust, because I would imagine that's mm. key, especially with the power dynamics. Mm. Do, do we going to take a couple of photo, um, questions, or shall I answer directly? We'll take a couple. Okay. I'm, I'm only raising my hand because it's related. Oh, good. No, no, I think that's a good idea. I don't know. Okay. So um, I, I think this I think this question is related, and I was curious in your the the circle with capacity building, and you mentioned capacity building not necessarily on the research topic. And I'm curious for you personally whether you enter into this with a sense of what that capacity building gap or need might be, or whether that's driven by stakeholders and kind of how you navigate mm -hmm. that piece. Mm. Okay, so I'll try and answer both of those. I think they're a bit different. So I think yours was, was about trust within the partnerships and yours is about the capacity building. Um, Trust within the partnerships, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with face-to-face -face meetings. So we have very geographically dispersed teams, and that's a big challenge for trust building. Um, even though we have an intranet, we have online spaces, we have a, a knowledge management platform, we have everything set up for electronic interaction in this program, the face-to-face -face meetings of those teams. Some of the teams have met every six months, even though they're based on two continents. Every, single, every six months it happens. Uh, most of the other teams, maybe every eight months. So a lot of face-to-face um, -face meetings, and um, I think a lot of bashing it out. To be honest, you know, it's been there've been some tense moments in all of the teams. The, the partnerships are not just a simple space, um, but I think that would be my, my my best answer to you right now. And we can talk about it more um, on the capacity building. And I'm trying to think of an example where the. It was where we knew that we'd need to offer it beforehand. I can't think of it. All of them were actually engaging with stakeholders about something that they wanted to you know, convey particular messages and getting the message back that they didn't know the background to that in the, in the first place. So we want to engage with the National Adaptation Planning Network on Glacier Retreat. And they're like, yeah, but how is Nepal set up for adaptation planning in the first place? OK, let's offer that training so that they'll be potentially more receptive. In Namibia, I didn't mention this one, that capacity building request, um, there was engagement with local government up in the, the north of Namibia about um, socially differentiated experiences and uh, you know, of um, water shortage and how do we deal with that. And the request was, like, well, how does local government work? And that's from local government offices. And so we offer training on local governance. But by offering that training, you're in the room for three days, and you're building relationships, and you're actually making those end users more able to use the next bit of information that you might be able to bring into that space. Um, 
So I think there was, there was certainly some um, capacity building planned from the start, but being so far down the road now, the ones that are in my mind have all been in response to, to demands. Is there a certain fluidity of funding in your projects that are built in from the beginning to allow you to respond to needs as they arise? So mm. you, you recognize a need, like in, in a lot of research projects, that's just not put aside at all. Mm. So if there is a need and, and a way to build those kinds of relationships with capacity building, or um, it, it seems like a great idea, but so how do you manage that? Mm. Uh, well, IDRC is a bit of a different donor. So we do what, what, what we call granting plus. So people like me work alongside research teams, uh, really deep understanding of what they're trying to do. Um, and yes, people's budgets can change, especially if we have a theory of change for the whole program, and that's IDRC's baby, if you like, the whole program, because each of these consortia are in their own uh, you know, research streams. But we have a theory of change for the whole program. And if an opportunity arises that helps us achieve the impact that we're seeking right in the beginning, then, and if we have the budget for it, we don't always, it's not an endless pot of money, it is a defined pot of money, so there's trade-offs, right? So then we look at, well, what are the trade-offs? If we want to respond to the stakeholder need, what, what, what are we not going to do that we had planned to do? But in my experience, usually what people had planned to do in the beginning is no longer relevant because things change and you realize that what you thought was going to be really important is really not very important. So um, I, we do provide that flexibility to just tell us. Yeah, we thought this particular activity was going to be important. It's no longer, but we have this demand and we want to react to it. And if the funding's there, then we, then we allow them to do that. But another way for you to do it, I think, with most research fundings is to have a budget line for research impact. And if you keep that fuzzy enough, then you can use it for the things that you need to use it for. Um, I'm not sure of all of your funders that all of you work with um, here at McGill, but I would imagine that there's enough fuzziness in those budget lines that you could possibly do that. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm here. Uh, I'm wondering if you encounter in the field any activity for the United Nations. They have multi programs working in this direction, like the disaster risk reduction, which is uh, contributed by UNESCO and UNDB, and they have a huge budget. Uh, so I don't know if you f find them, if you found any um, uh, accumulative knowledge from their work, from their previous work. Thank you. Um, could I ask you to be more more specific? So, um, I mean, there is like so local <coughs> local UN funded research programs around. No, it's change. it's regional. It's like your program. Uh, most most of them they are regional uh, regional programs. It's mm -hmm. not uh, country wise. Uh, I think the disaster risk reduction is something that um, exists yeah. in in ecosystem based. So I don't know if you found anything because mm. their budget is huge, and I think, I mean, according to my, my experience, their impact is little as United Nations. I don't know where mm. is the problem. Maybe you can comment on that. <laughs> I'd prefer not to. Thanks. Um, <laughs> the one that springs to mind, um, the you know UNEP's ecosystem-based adaptation. Um, they sit on our advisory committee, um, so there is definitely an open line of communication between at least UNEP and ourselves. Um, and I can't comment with a lot of confidence on whether our local teams are interacting with the UN projects on the ground. So I think that's the best I can do. Yes, so I was wondering, you, you talked about NGOs and researchers. Do you have any, is it more multidisciplinary? Do you have private industry? Or have you had any experience mm -hmm. with that kind of partnership and any challenges there at all? With the, with the private sector? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm just wondering how multidisciplinary is, uh, are these uh, collaborations and partnerships? Okay. Um, I understand you just say multi-partner, right? So you're interested in the private. So uh, disciplinary in terms of academic disciplines, very transdisciplinary, I would say. Um, in the private sector, one of the consortia that I didn't really speak about t today is um, PRIZE, who, that works in semi-arid regions across Africa and, and Asia, and their project is very much about the economic dimensions of, of adaptation, looking at value chains, um, and that that project has a lot of private sector partners. Um, and I, But I'm not confident to answer in terms of the challenges involved in those partnerships, but I could certainly link you up with them too, because they have, they, they have been documenting some of their challenges in relation to that. 
I have an extended question to what she just asked. Um, I have two questions, but I will ask this one first. So what role do you see for startups or young entrepreneurs to get involved in policy interventions or like projects like these that you were talking about? Because most of the startups I feel uh, come into being because they see a problem existing and they want to solve it. So mm -hmm. how, how can you integrate them into this process? Yeah. Um, so we, there's something very interesting happening right now where we are really looking quite seriously at knowledge brokers. I'm not sure that this is an entrepreneur's area, but you would know better than me. Um, right now we're looking at partnering with um, primarily large NGOs, um, South South North, um, ICLE and others. Um, and the rationale there is that we don't have a problem, we were talking about this over lunch, a problem with enough knowledge about climate change adaptation. What we have is a saturated information space that policymakers don't know how to make sense of in many, in many instances. And what we don't have are these knowledge brokers that can play this intermediary role between the science that we have in droves in many, in many instances and the policy world that's going like, what do we do with all this information? What's accurate? What do we, you know? So I think there is maybe something there around knowledge brokering. I think it's, it's kind of coming up right now on quite a large scale, at least we're thinking about it on quite a large scale. Um, how do we synthesize um, this information? Basically take what I'm describing as research into use, but do it kind of regionally um, within, Af in, in our case, yeah, it would be with, within Africa, within Asia and Latin America. I don't know if that's a space that <laughs> you could fill. Hi. Um, thanks for your talk. That was actually really interesting. And one of the things that did strike me was one of your, well, I think you framed it as a failure, but um, uh, the inability of some of the lessons that you were learning across different sites to sort of translate um, or help inform strategies in different places. And I was wondering if, um, I mean, you know, all of us sitting here in, in academia, we do our individual research in little places and we hope that sort of has generalizability. It's all our theory of change. Um, and I was wondering if you had any insights as to what can help make that happen better or uh, if you did have successes or what was some of the barriers were. So the, that lesson actually, it was very interesting. We had a, a midterm evaluation of carrier and if you think about how a program like this is set up, we actually create, we, 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 we designed them as, as climate change hotspots and those hotspots, all but one of the consortia work across the, both continents, right? So they, they'll have some countries in Africa, some in Asia. And so one of our assumptions of the whole program was that this would be valuable, that regional scale research across continents created opportunities for learning between countries. Um, and our midterm evaluation said that's not what decision makers are telling us in, in the countries in which you're working. And our research into use leads were telling the evaluators, yeah, like the, mo the biggest success we've had is in country. Actually, both of the stories of change I've just shared with you, they were in particular countries on particular issues. Um, so have I got the solution to that? No, I don't. Um, I think one of the things we're also learning about regional scale, generalizability, because we're doing a bunch of synthesis work at different scales. We're synthesizing uh, Southern Africa, East Africa, West Africa, India, and so on. Um, and then we're doing sort of global synthesis. Is as you move up those levels, like who's the audience? You know, and when you ask that question, you suddenly start to think, well, what, what's the purpose of that generalized synthesis paper? Because who's the audience for that? Um, and as you get further up at a global scale, you're looking at the IPCC for a program like this in terms of like a policy audience, and they just get thinner and thinner. And at the regional scale, what we've learned is that there's very few policy audiences at that scale. So it makes sense academically and scientifically. These are connected systems, the one, as I described, the, the Himalayan region. This is a connected system across countries. It makes absolute sense from a research perspective for us to treat these areas as regions. But when you're wanting to connect with policy, it makes less sense. Then you're back down to Nepal and China. You know, and so I don't have an answer for you, other than it's been quite an interesting learning piece for us in the program, that that regional scale focus doesn't make a lot of sense when you're after impact. Um, I, I guess I just have one more oh. question, which was, do you think that the NGOs that you partnered with will, if you, when you reach out another time, would they be more likely or less likely to want to partner with you? Mm -hmm. Has this been a 
Posit net positive or net negative experience? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want to speak on all of their behalfs, but um, what I shared about Oxfam's experience, that's a story of change that they wrote for us, about their, well, with me, about their experience of being in this program. It's been, at least for that partner, and that's the one that I work with most closely, um, it's really been a kind of expansion of their networks, and it's got them into some of the sort of global policy fora that are traditionally dominated by academics. Um, so I would say, at least in that case, it's been net positive, but I, I couldn't speak for all of them. Yeah. Thank you. So um, that was very interesting, very thought-provoking. I'm now going to go and look at my list of NGOs. Um, I'd like to, uh, for us to all join and uh, thank Georgina for this talk.